Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the talk about interesting security patches that Microsoft released in the past two years. Uh, now, you know, most people make mistakes and learn from them. And in this talk, I'd like to show you that Microsoft is no exception, and the patches that we release are a lesson for us that we apply in our daily job. My name is Greg Wroblewski, and uh, I am security researcher working with Damian Haas and uh, Microsoft Security Response Center. And, you know, I really like breaking software. Uh, and not only software, hardware too, although my son is much better than that one. Uh, I also like breaking wood, concrete, uh, etc. And as, as you probably have, have guessed, I come from Pakistan. Uh, when I got my PhD in Pakistan Institute of Technology, and I belong to the same tribe as Joanna Rutkowska and the famous LSD guys. So at Microsoft, we, most of the time we break software. And in my team, it all starts when a security vulnerability is being reported uh, externally or, or found in the wild. And my, my job is to investigate the problem, find variations, uh, take care of proper patch development process, and even verify bulletin. Uh, the goal is always to keep the customer secure. So that's the one part that I described is, we call it the reactive part, but we also have a proactive part where the, the lessons that we learn from patch, patches that developed, we apply to the new products and we apply as changes to our development process. Today I'd like to talk about five cases that were uh, really good lessons for us. And you may notice that some of, some of these cases made headlines at their time uh, and were quite famous. So let's start from the quite very well-known case. And uh, I remember it was uh, December 2005, the Christmas time. Uh, my, wife was, my wife was making uh, pierogi borscht and uh, I put Christmas tree, kids were singing carols. And then, you know, comes this uh, big old jelly uh, man and brings uh, presents. And, you know, he comes every year and brings something for the good Microsoft guys. But on that year, he, he misplaced our present and he brought it to someone, I think, in Pakistan. So fortunately, the guys from Web, WebSense, they, they found this present and they reported this to us and they said, hey, when you go to this link, there is this strange file, it's WMF picture and it executes code in an Internet Explorer. And we said, okay, this is, this is not correct. It should not work like that. So we started investigation and it quickly turned out that there is a code execution, in fact, and it goes from from uh, this function pointer. And, but how it happened, it's, you know, it's like pretty obvious uh, feature and how, how it happened that we, we missed this. And in fact, we released a security patch in October 2005. Uh, so somehow something went wrong with our process and we, we still didn't catch the feature. And it turns out that this feature was introduced in very early in the development of Windows operating system, uh, back then when the Windows was 16-bit, uh, like in, uh, the entire Windows was in 16-bit world. And this feature was, was about printing. Uh, printing pictures in early 90s could take a long time on a computer. So we added this feature for applications to register function pointers and allow them to abort the printing operation. Now, the, the way that the pointer gets set from the, from the picture file, it's, it's, it's not that simple. Uh, you get the main loop drawing the picture, you have uh, one function, another function, then yet another function, and finally the pointer gets set, then we go back to the loop where the malicious code uh, gets executed. Now, you could understand that uh, in a 20 years old code, it's it's, it's obvious that, that people can miss this kind of feature still being present. But if you look at the picture file, 
the structures that describe this behavior are really simple. And that was the key learning for us. Uh, basically, we decided that we must test the, test the program with all the data that program can handle. Uh, in security research, we call it proper fuzzing coverage. So from that time, all our fuzzing must cover all data types that a program or feature can handle. And as an example, I could give you a, a, another file format, which is really also very old, the uh, EMF uh, file format, uh, where in 2005 we were working on, on, on uh, the, the part of the GDI component that is processing these uh, uh, picture files, and since then there was not a single security patch uh, in that area. And so we applied the same uh, process to, to other areas as well, and, and uh, that was the first learning. Another learning was that the old features can really hurt us, uh, but we cannot just remove them because uh, people use them and customers want them very often. So you probably noticed that in Windows Vista, many legacy features were either removed or blocked in some way. Now, uh, the next case uh, that I have is, uh, was reported to us by uh, Andreas Sandblad from uh, Secunia. And uh, it was a code execution in uh, create text range. And you can see that uh, the code that was responsible for the problem is, uh, is quite simple. Uh, but, and basically, most people who saw this code, they said, oh, this is, there is no bug in this code. There is no security issue. And in fact, the, the bug that you can see is uh, the, on, the only one is uh, that uh, when going through cleanup uh, label, the two error code paths, uh, only one sets the error code, uh, which means that the function returns success while it's not performing any function. Uh, anything useful. And in this case, the useful thing was setting uh, PP, PP this pointer to, to something useful. Uh, so now you, you, you can think how, how this is a problem, right? Uh, and it turns out that uh, it is a problem uh, because it just happens that there is a code that relies on this uh, this error code value being returned. And if the code returns success, uh, then it tries to use the pointer, which was not in initialized. So that means that we can execute code on the heap. And when the heap spraying methods became popular, this kind of bugs uh, just happened to be very, very serious. In fact, uh, I own this case, and uh, I was looking for similar problems. And I couldn't find them. But, you know, it's, it's not easy to scan thousands or hundreds of thousands of lines of code. So I scanned just the area nearby, and there was not a single problem. And this issue was being actively exploited. Uh, so we had to release a patch. We, we couldn't wait until I scanned the 100,000 lines of code or someone else. So we released the patch, and... Uh, a few months later, Andreas came back to us and said, hey, there's another bug, and it was almost exactly the same bug, only in a completely different place of, of uh, Internet Explorer. So uh, what happened since then is that uh, we improved our static analysis tools, and uh, now we can, we can detect similar issues at the code development time. Uh, it's, it's most of the time it happens when the uh, binary gets built. Uh, so, and as far as I remember, we, we, we did find uh, problems of this class of problems uh, uh, in, in, in Vista and we fixed them. Uh, now, uh, the next case, uh, I remember this one, it, uh, it's, it uh, was handled by Damian. And I remember the day where the, the, the a case came in because Damian just sat down in his office and he was just looking at the monitor with this painful, painful look and 
You know, he just looked like a guy who looks at a girl, knowing that the girl doesn't love him. And, <laughs> and, and finally he asked for help for some other, other, other partner from, from our team. And uh, together they figure out what the problem is. And if you look at, the, there's obviously the, the function w sprint that's, that looks suspicious at the bottom of the slide. Uh, but, uh, and we have some buffer and uh, the registry functions that read, read a key. Uh, but if you check the documentation, everything's all right. Uh, the buffer size is 360. Attacker does not control the registry database. Uh, the key name is limited to 255 characters, so there is there is just not a there is no problem in this code. But yet the, the overflow somehow happened, and it was reported by EI to us, uh, so they know what they're doing. And uh, what happened is that the API that we are calling is 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 doing more more than we suspect. Basically, we are making some assumptions that are not in the uh, in the MSDN documentation, but uh, uh, actually maybe no, they, they are not. They were not there back then. So uh, the API was just removing trailing backslashes from the registry key name, and if the key did exist, it would return success, which means that you could you could create the and pass key of uh, any length and still overflow the buffer. And uh, in this case, the, we, we cannot just change API the way we want in a security patch very often because uh, that changes uh, functionality and uh, people complain that oh, compatibility is broken. So what we, but obviously just get rid of, of those, all those unsafe string processing functions. So we in initiated the uh, so-called band APIs effort and uh, Last year, John Lambert from Microsoft uh, during Black Hat was talking about, about this. Uh, basically, in, in, during Windows Vista development, we had a huge list of band APIs. Uh, and again, the usage of these APIs is being detected during the uh, build process. So the next case started when uh, we released a patch for a buffer overflow. And you see the patch right now. Uh, so the patch was just a simple check preventing buffer overflow from happening. And attacker controlled the uh, length of some data that was being passed and, and we had to prevent the overflow from happening. So you may think, man, this, these Microsoft guys are dumb. They, they can't even, even get the simple check right. Uh, but you know, let's, let's see how, how the check really is simple. So, you know, this total space available thing, it unfolds into something more complicated and then in even something more complicated. And, you know, I, I handled this case. Um, so the first time I saw the code, because, you know, in Pakistan we teach children hexadecimal and binary first and decimal later. So I decided to just evaluate it in my head, the value. So I started like 4096 is 1000 hex. Uh, minus 8 is FF8, minus the size of CPH info, which was something like 52, which is 3, 4 hex. That would be FC, uh, C, and things like that. So I came up, came up with some value, and uh, we started our testing process. Uh, but eventually what happened is, is that we should have looked at the assembly. And in assembly, this complicated expression became just simple value FA8. And since this is a check against overflow, it's reasonable to create a test that would, that would cover these edge cases where we cross the, the buffer size. And it just happened that in our testing, we missed this range. And it turned out that FA8 was not correct. The correct value should be F80. So we still had the buffer flow. Fortunately, it was just a denial of service uh, on a local service. So uh, not a really critical issue. And that gave us a lot of, lot of uh, uh, thinking. Uh, so obviously the custom allocators that people use are dangerous and we try to get rid of them whenever it's possible. And we require people annotate them in code development. 
And also, it's verifying fixing assembly. It's you know, it's sometimes much simpler than just looking at the code. So, the last case that I have is uh, a case in uh, in in a, in a Windows component that uh, uh, was allowing for local elevation of privilege, and uh, the NGS reported a problem in data validation when uh, data was uh, coming through a shared section memory and uh, basically we are copying the data to the local variable while uh, the find create font function where had the vulnerability was still taking the original pstate info data in shared section which can be changed by uh, by some thread in user mode uh, uh, running in parallel. Now, obviously, you see that uh, the validation is uh, is before the find create font function is called. Uh, so, let, let's assume that we even we fix the problem here. Uh, you, you may suspect that the, the real problem is somewhere deeper. And by releasing this patch, you know, if Dan Kaminsky would see this, I, I, I'm sure he would say just. What could possibly go wrong? And, and when he says that, something always goes wrong. And in fact, uh, it went wrong because uh, we released the patch. And a few days later, Cesar Cerudo came back to us and said, hey, but I can still reach the vulnerable function through a completely different call path. So we had no choice but to uh, fix the problem at the root cause and release another patch. And that, this, this case gave us a lot of uh, good, good learnings too. Uh, so we learned that we must analyze the, the co all the code paths that lead, that lead to the vulnerable code. Uh, and we learned that the best way to fix is, is just to fix the problem at the root cause. And uh, uh, we are trying to do this right now. Uh, and it's, it's not an easy task, but uh, yeah, fixing root cause is our main goal. So as you have seen, uh, at, at Microsoft not only fixes uh, security issues that that have uh, that 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 that, it, that are being found in in uh, our products, but we also learn from our mistakes. We improve our development process, and uh, we really appreciate uh, people working with us. Uh, helping us in this in this task, and uh, I hope that in, with time Microsoft software will become as solid as as a piece of concrete. Thank you very much. <laughs>